Great. Hello, all right, we're ready to get started. So we have two talks today. Um, and first talking to us about quantum computing will be Odell Padon. So. Thank you. So thank you for coming to this uh, session overview. Uh, so we have four exciting papers. And I'll try to give maybe a little bit of background. So quantum computing, it's, it's a really exciting thing that happened. It is started as a very theoretical vision of, uh, of Richard Feynman, you know, many decades ago. And today we actually have physical quantum machines that, that are being built and people are, are trying to, to think of ways of using them. And uh, something that Richard Feynman said about quantum mechanics is that nobody basically understands it or that anyone who thinks understand it doesn't understand it. And of course, when I was asked to give this session overview, I said, sure, I'll talk for a few minutes, I'll explain quantum mechanics, and then I'll give an overview of the talks. So I think if you'll uh, stay tuned, I, I promise to give you an illusion that you understand quantum mechanics, and I'll hopefully also give you an overview of the talks in the, in the session, and maybe what you'll get beyond what you could get from the abstract is what is the common theme of these papers, and how it fits with the general uh, PL research tradition. So let's get started with some quantum computing basics. So the first thing that we need to understand to understand quantum computing is superposition. So uh, I want to introduce it with this double slit experiment. It's a very famous experiment that was one of the origins of quantum mechanics. And uh, the idea is that you have some source of light or it could be particles like electrons. And there are two slits that the particles can go through and then there is a screen. And instead of seeing, you know, just two, two stripes mirroring the, the two slits, we actually see this interference pattern that can be explained by interference of waves. So if these are waves, it, it's, it's very well understood. Some places we have constructive interference, some places we have destructive interference. But uh, if these are particles, it's not really understood. So you could say, well, maybe this is just waves. But in fact, even if you use electrons, you get the same pattern. And even if you use a source that is very, very weak. It sends only a photon or an electron, uh, and it sends the next one only after the first one already hit the screen, still you get the same pattern. So it really is one particle interfering with itself. And this leads us to a notion of superposition and uh, to a notion of a qubit. So a, a classical bit can be in one of two states, zero or one. And the quantum bit or a qubit can be in a superposition of those two states where the superposition is characterized by a, a unitary, sorry, by a unit uh, complex uh, vector, and really you need these complex ampli amplitudes to account for in interference. And when you measure uh, a quantum bit, you will get zero with probability uh, alpha squared or, or one with probability beta squared here. And the measurement also collapses the state. So if you measure it again, you're gonna get the same result that you measured before. Now the state changed from being a mixed state to a pure state. Now, if I have two qubits, then the state would be uh, a vector in a four-dimensional complex space for all the combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And if we have n qubits, it's going to be 2 to the n. That's going to be the dimensionality of, of our state vectors. And again, when we measure, we get with these probabilities, the, the amplitudes of the complex number give us the probabilities and we'll collapse the state. All right. So now let's talk about another very strange quantum phenomena, which is entanglement. So consider this state where we take a superposition of 0, 0, and 1, 1 for two qubits. And let's say we measure the first qubit. So what are we going to get? We're going to get with probability 50%, we're going to get 0. In with 50% probability, we're going to get 1. Now, if instead we measured the second qubit, we would get the same probability distribution. But if we measured, let's say, the first qubit, and then we got 0, and then we collapse the state, and then we measure the second qubit, we're always going to get zero. So these two qubits are entangled. And this leads to some very strange phenomena that uh, led uh, Einstein and other scientists to attack uh, quantum theory. So those of you who know me know that I cannot have a talk without the words EPR. But here this EPR is einstein podelsky rosen uh, paradox. And this paradox is that you have these two entangled qubits, and you send... Uh, one qubit, let's say I send one qubit one way, I send the other qubit another way, and our measurement over there can affect the outcome over there. This seems completely paradoxical, but that's, that's just how it goes. Um, and that's about as much time as I have to say about this here, but it's very interesting. So what does this give us for computation? 
It turns out it can give us very, uh, a more powerful model of computation. And the reason for that is b exactly because of this superposition, entanglement, and interference. So, for example, you can have an algorithm that is looking for a prime decomposition of a number, and if you can set it up, and this is what Shor's, al Shor, Shor's algorithm does, if you can set it up such that your qubit, your system, will explore, so remember we have two to the n quantum states. Your system would explore all of them, two to the n possible, po possible solutions. If you can set it up such that you have constructive interference between the solutions that you, that you care about, that solve the problem, let's say the prime decomposition, and destructive interference for the non-solutions of your system, then you can, it seems like you can explore an exponential search space in polynomial time. All right, but that's every, all the time I have to say about that. So the next thing I want to explain is uh, quantum gates. These are the basic building blocks of quantum computing. So remember the, uh, the state of a, of a qubit is given by a, a unit vector, and the operators of this qubit are unitary matrices that preserve, that transform one unit vector to another unit vector. And this is what's called the Pauli X gate, is the analog of the classical negation logical gate. You see it will transform 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. We also have some single qubit gates that, are, that don't have a classic analog. They just uh, change the, the superposition between the two states. And we also have some two-qubit gates, for example, a controlled node, which is like the classical XOR, which flips one, the value of one bit according to the value of another bit. And its semantics is going to be given by a four by four unitary matrix. And from these gates, we can compose them and construct quantum circuits. So for example, here we have a circuit over five qubits, and it's the natural way to write its semantics is as a, a matrix that manipulates two to the ve complex vectors of two to the five, and it should be unitary. All right. So now let's talk about the, uh, the papers that we have in the session and what is the PL research uh, that we're doing here. And the very classical PL question is what is the right semantics? So of course on the bottom we have the uh, analog reality of the given by, described by the quantum physics. These are continuous functions of space and time. We talked about this digital abstraction of qubits and, and quantum gates. And maybe on the top, we have some actual programming language where you, you describe your quantum algorithm. But we are very interested in trying to describe more abstract semantics than these things. And for example, we would like to have some sort of axiomatic or algebraic semantics that would let us analyze programs without really re resorting to this low level thing. M much similar to how we do in classical computing. We don't usually use the bit level semantics to reason about programs. So we can have alg axiomatic or algebraic semantics. We can have process calculi. We can consider higher order programs. And we have some classical features we want for these semantics. Like we want them to be sound. Maybe we want them to be complete or, or we want them to abstract. We want them to maybe be fully abstract. And we can also go even go beyond the, the digital abstraction and consider directly programming the, the analog uh, quantum devices. And in fact, these are exactly the four papers uh, of this session. So the first paper uh, uh, uses something called an, uh, an extension of something called the rig groupoid or the rig category to give an equational theory of quantum circuits that will uh, let us reason about the equality between quantum gates and circuits, not by considering their matrices, but by considering some algebraic theory. The second paper talks about communicating quantum devices and defines a process, calculi, a process calculus that, that describes them. And an interesting property there is whether two processes are equivalent or not, and there are many subtleties, subtleties because of the combination of non-determinism, measurement, and entanglement. For example, let's say I have a, this entangled state that we talked about, and I send one qubit here and one qubit there it, on two different channels. So on each channel, I send something which is 50% 0, 50% 1. I can do it with an entangled state, and I can do it with a non-entangled state. And maybe some calculi would consider these two programs equal, some others, others would not. And this is what this paper considers. The third paper actually goes below the digital abstraction, because in many cases, we want to use quantum computing to simulate quantum processes, simulate quantum systems, and it turns out it could be much more efficient to do it with, uh, uh, the, without the breaking the digital abstraction. You can do it in, in le with less resources. So it defines 
uh, a programming language for describing the simulations you want to run, a language for describing the capabilities of your analog device, and what you would expect, a compiler that gets these two and, and decomposes your program to f and compiles the program for your device. And finally, the, the last paper considers higher order programs and gives semantics, uh, semantics for, of it, which is fully abstract. And there are many intricacies that exactly arise because of the differences from classical probabilistic uh, uh, semantics because of entanglement and also because of higher order and being recursive types. And if you uh, want to think about it in, on this scale of abstraction, so we have really this uh, digital abstraction. We have three papers that consider more abstract semantics. One that considers the semantics that is even below the digital and going for the, for the uh, analog. And the goals of these papers are classic PL goals. We want abstraction, we want to have the right notions of equivalence, and we want efficiency. So thank you to the speakers of all of these uh, papers, and I hope you come to the talk. Thank you.